Welcome back to When Stars Fill Half the Sky, a novel by Pete Caputo. This is Chapter 20, Free Will and Future Plans, from the memoirs of Michael Fiveland. Julie's psyche was not quite yet attuned to the rigors of traveling the half-realm, so she could not recall our visit with Sebastian. Moreover, journeys into the future were a different animal. Not only was it extremely demanding on the physical body, but also extremely draining emotionally. I retained it all, but I couldn't bring myself to share any of it with her, not after knowing how painful it was for her to see Sebastian become a shill for the collective. She was worn and tired after back-to-back -back journeys, so we didn't talk for the rest of the flight. After landing, we were moved to the NWA facility in the Swiss countryside. We were subjected to a full day of evaluations and testing, and then placed in adjacent cells with only bars between us. We were now free to talk to each other, but knew that privacy was not assured. So we continued to communicate non-verbally. We had both aged another 10 years as well. The toll, especially on her body, was evident as she was now considered a high-risk pregnancy case. Soon after, our baby girl was born, three pounds, seven ounces, after only six and a half months. There were some complications, but after a few weeks in the ICU, she was stable enough to come home. That's home to our jail cells in the NWA, of course. In spite of our protesting, our daughter, like us, had become a prisoner and political asset for the collective. Julie's breast milk was pumped and given to someone else to feed our child. After a week, we were allowed brief chaperoned visits, which were monitored for Morisell activity. Fortunately, Dr. Liebschinger took a liking to Julie and made it possible for us to stay with our daughter for longer than the collective would have liked. We should name her soon, I said to Julie one morning during one of our treasured visits. The doctor encouraged us to do it before a name would be chosen for her. Julie looked at her baby intently. Her tiny face moved slowly from side to side, and her eyes peeked open only momentarily, as if the ambient sunlight filtered in from a window across the room was too much to bear. Brigitte. Her name is Brigitte. That's a perfect name. The door opened. Dr. Grundel Lipschinger stepped in with an NWA guard. It was time to take the baby away. Julie resisted, but only slightly, clearly not as strongly as the last time. Something was changing with her. It suddenly dawned on me that she was no longer protected by the lead-lined walls of Area 70. The implants she received when she first started working for the NWA were once again reshaping her behavior. There were brief moments when she tried to fight it, but its influence on the human mind was way too strong. Her cognitive processes were no longer her own. I scribbled our name choice on a piece of notepaper and handed it to her. Doctor, her name is Brigitte. Make sure they know that. Yes, I will tell them. Julie was slipping away. After giving birth, I could barely get her to communicate, even non-verbally. In the days that followed, I saw a steady change in her demeanor. I was losing her to the influence and control of the collective, thanks to those damned implants. I know what they wanted. They wanted her Morisell and her access to the half-realm. Jesus, what a mess! I cried out. Julie looked at me, but no longer with a look of agreement or in shared commiseration. With almost a scowl of disdain and contempt, she shuddered at the mention of that name. I realized at that moment I had hit rock bottom. There was nowhere to go, no one to lean on or trust. Any hope of escaping the clutches of my enemy was all but gone. That was when I finally realized I had to go see him one more time.
After hugging John the Baptist, his cousin, Jesus left the banks of the Jordan River where he was just baptized. His clothes were still dripping wet as he ascended the mountainous path, winding to the east where the empty wilderness stretched out before him. Jesus walked as a man on a mission, venturing deeper and deeper into nothingness. The taste of earthen minerals filled his already parched mouth and throat in the noonday sun, but he carried no water, nor was there any in sight. Pushing on, Jesus began speaking to someone he referred to as Abba. He continued this poignant conversation with his invisible friend, asking for strength, begging for wisdom, and praying for grace, all the while singing songs of recognition and praise to the God of his forefathers. This went on for hours until he stopped for the night as the growing shadows stretched across the rocky valley below. I waited for him to finish praying. Stars were populating the ever-blackening sky. The temperature was dropping precipitously as well. Jesus shivered for a moment as he pulled his tunic tightly around his neck and settled into a fetal position with his back against a large boulder. A snake slithered toward him, but he paid little attention to it, neither showing fear nor concern. He simply closed his eyes and appeared to be falling asleep. Michael, he called as his voice reverberated from the ravine a hundred meters away. Are you just going to stare at me for the next thirty-something days? I, uh, I, I really don't know what to... I, I mean, I, I thought you were praying, so I, I didn't want to disturb you. Come closer. Let's talk. Jesus answered, repositioning into a seated position. He looked straight at me and continued. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever wondered why you can see me even though you should be looking through my eyes and my memories? Well, y yes, uh, that thought crossed my mind, but I thought it was just another mystery of the Morricelle. No mystery. The reason you can see me is because we are not alone. No one is ever alone. The realm of the spirit is everywhere at all times. And beings from the spiritual realm can also see into the half-realm. That is why the evil one came to you and spoke to you in the cave. But my angels were there as well. You come here from a very unique time and place where my spirit is no longer present. After the day of the sun, as you call it, the world would never be the same. But you are already aware of this, aren't you? I've been told that you no longer care for the people in my time. It's been said the world is cursed and you have left us to our own demise. He just looked at me and smiled, his eyes glassy with tears, yet his heart full of compassion. I could feel it. Michael, there is... So much you do not know yet. You and your mother were specifically chosen to experience something truly unique, for you were given the gift of seeing from the heavens, much different from what you see down here with those human eyes of yours. You really have no way to fully explain it. I know you've tried, but how could anyone know unless they've been there for themselves. Still, you are but a sentient being caught within a physical frame of reference. Unlike your mother who has left her body, your perspective, although supernatural, is still limited. Lord, what happened to her? Your mother is with me now. With you? Now? But neither of you will be born for another 2,000 years. <laughs> oh, you still look at time as points on a straight line. Come here, my son. Jesus reached out and touched my forehead. Instantly, the portal reopened, viewing that faraway constellation of 
inaccessible life forms glowing brightly. He took me closer, and I saw them, millions upon millions of lives, safely and securely dwelling in a most beautiful place. It was somewhat reminiscent of the sacred garden in Teleria, but even more spectacular. There she was, surrounded by what appeared to be a cloud of others. After a moment, he retracted his arm, and the image disappeared instantly. I was overcome with emotion, not knowing why I could not join her and why I was left to endure the pain and suffering of my present age. The reason she is with me is simply because she realizes who I am. You, my son, are still struggling, and so you remain. I don't want to fight you anymore, Lord. What do I need to do? I once told you, I am the Good Shepherd. I remember that, but, but what am I still missing? You're conflicted, still caught between two worlds. While you claim to know who I am, you still believe you must fight your enemies on your own. And you still believe in your abilities to conjure up enough strength and fortitude to defeat them. You even think the tree of life you possess is enough. Yes, it is powerful, but it will never be enough. So why was it given to me then? To let you see that even something as wonderful, as powerful, and as eternal as the tree of life is not enough to save you. My son, this was given to you so that you can see how much you need me. I will fight for you. I will stand with you. But how was I ever supposed to know that if you removed your spirit from my time? You said it yourself that your spirit in my time is gone, no longer present with humanity. And as long as you dwell in that time, you will not see me, nor will you sense my spirit. But here in this place, you know. You know. But what about the others in my time? How could they ever know? What will happen to them? The very reason you are asking these questions is the most important step you've ever taken, Michael. There is no greater love that a man should lay down his life for another. This is why you are here now, to see for yourself what I must do. But you still have questions that plague you. Yes, I do, Lord, I answered. And even before those words fully passed my lips, it was as if scales were falling from my eyes. I saw into a new place, a reality, far greater than anything I'd ever experienced in the half-realm. In this place, the answer to what plagued me was as clear as day. The answer was simply, it takes nothing less than a creator to save his creation. That's when I knew my life would never be the same. This was why my mother was absorbed into that paradise beyond the dark chasm. Not only did she know what he represented, she also believed it for herself. She had finally surrendered to the call of the Good Shepherd. She had finally come home, where all who believe sincerely belong. But there was still something in my heart that kept me from doing the same, and he knew exactly what I was thinking. Michael, you are not ready yet because of your wife and children, your love for them, and your concern for your world, all this is causing you to hold on. I can't just leave them. I, I want them here as well, but I don't know what to do. The Morricelle or Tree of Life or whatever it is, it doesn't always give me the answers. But you can. Tell me, Lord, please, what happens to them? That's all I need to know. Jesus was quiet for a moment. Reaching down, he clutched a handful of dirt, lifted his arm, and then slowly allowed it to fall between ever-opening fingers. He continued, We can both see how this dirt falls, but surely I tell you now, I can sense each grain as
as it topples to the ground. I can count them cascading through my hand. Likewise, I know the fate of all life and life forms. But in creation, there will always be the act of free will. It governs the movements of every being, every mind, every thought. You have been to the future. That is more than most will ever imagine. But for me to tell you any more than what you have seen would conflict with this fundamental basis of creation. Telling you someone's eternal fate would shatter this basic building block of creation itself. Everyone at some point in their lives will face me, just as you are right now. Every one of them in their own time and place. My son, what I tell you now is the same thing generations of believers have known and will know for as long as time will exist. My father so loved this world that he gave the thing most precious to him, this act of pure love, this act of unconditional sacrifice is more powerful than any foe, any evil, or anything that would ever attempt to come against Elohim and his creation. Jesus paused, gazing up at the gathering stars. Even hell itself is powerless against this kind of love. You know what I am talking about because you know what I am about to do and what will happen to me as a result of my act of free will. I was speechless. I recalled how difficult it was to watch him suffer and die at the hands of the Roman soldiers. That image would forever be burned into my psyche, having witnessed it firsthand. But I never fully understood why he allowed it to happen until now. I looked at him, his eyes full of love, and knew if I gave the word, I would have been instantly transported to that constellation of lights where my mother was, safe from harm and pain, completely removed from the agony and torment of life. It would have been that easy. All I needed to do was to say, take me, and I would have been gone. No more worries, no more suffering. But somehow, Jesus knew differently. Just like your mother, who had her greatest hour, yours, my son, is yet to come. Like an angel sent from heaven, fight for them. Michael, go back and do what you must do. My spirit may not be there, but no matter what happens, remember, my love is more powerful than any evil work your enemies can conjure. You want me to love my enemies? I, I don't think I can ever do that. I am not asking you to do anything except to remember that I desire to love them through you. Surrender to me in those moments. Let my desire to love overwhelm you. Then you will see my power in those moments. You will know that pure love is me living inside of you. Then you will understand how time is as temporary as the universe itself. It will all come to pass. But my love is eternal, and I will never leave you nor forsake you. Never. Now go, my son, and remember. Suddenly I was back quicker than any transition out of the half-realm I'd ever experienced. It was as if I was not even in the half-realm at all. It was like something I'd never experienced before. There was a feeling deep inside me, a reassuring feeling that everything was going to be all right. I didn't know how to explain it or describe it, except that it was like a religious experience, something so foreign to my way of thinking, my culture, my lifestyle. Yet it was a transcendental moment defining my life from that moment on. Julie looked at me and stared strangely at the new glimmer in my eye. She asked me what was wrong. I said nothing. I just reached over and kissed her. 
What's that for? I love you. And I love our kids more than anything. I could tell she knew what I was about to do, but was already too conditioned by her implants to fight it. That was it. I'd seen enough. Guard! Take me to the collective. I'm ready. Will Michael be successful in sacrificing his own life in order to keep his family safe? Find out in the next chapter as he prepares to join the collective.